Welcome back. Today I want to take you through all the essentials that you'll need to get started in loading. Now, as I told you earlier, I'm going to break this down into several different uh, parts and uh, that, makes, that, that makes the whole thing go a little bit easier so you don't get overwhelmed with uh, the whole loading process in one video. Uh, but right now, the most important thing is to know uh, what you need to have in order to get started and I'll also try to break that down into uh, the, the very basic components that you need and then a little bit more uh, advanced as you go along. So let's uh, take a look at it all. Everything you see before you is, uh, th this is everything that you really need to have. Uh, now some of it's a little bit more elaborate than you certainly would need, uh, and we'll go through that one by one. Uh, this, this right here, as I told you in the first video, uh, this is essential. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is the uh, only way that you can safely reload. You have to have a manual. Don't. Uh, and let me say one thing: if if you have not watched uh, the first video, please do, because each of my each of my videos, I'm presuming that you've watched the one previous to it. Uh, if you haven't, uh, you're going to be missing out on things. Don't let the title fool you. Uh, there, there's information that I provide that is uh, absolutely essential to build upon for for the next lesson. So whether you're a beginning reloader or whether you're watching this because you want to um, become a better reloader, I really um, urge you to watch each video in line. Uh, <clears throat> whether you're using just a regular um, calculator or smartphone, you'll find use for a calculator. I don't, I don't know how anybody could load without having some sort of uh, calipers. Now these are, these are expensive uh, Minotoyos, you don't have to buy uh, expensive calipers. Nothing is that, nothing is that uh, critical that you'll be using it every single day uh, and needing that sort of uh, needing that sort of expense. Uh, so whatever you can purchase, uh, you know, within reason. There are different there are different companies out there that make these. Uh, I suggest that you try them out. Um, one thing that I do prefer is a dial caliper. I I, I find that they're a lot uh, they're a lot more reliable than um, the battery operated digital ones. The battery operated digital ones, you know, the if if you're if you're down and doing your, if you're doing your reloading, all of a sudden the battery's gone. Uh, you can't make your measurements. This here will just simply work all the time, and it's easy to read, very very easy to read. And we'll show you how to do that. And you can buy these in nylon. You can buy these in plastic that are a lot less money. Um, and check the prices all around. Um, you'll need to have a means of trimming your cases to length because they will lengthen. Uh, as time goes on. After the first two or three shots they will lengthen. This right here is a case length gauge specific to the caliber, uh, specific to the cartridge. This one here is marked right on for 223. Uh, it'll work with uh, the NATO cartridge as well. Um, it, it has a specific length which is measured from the end of this uh, the end of this decapping. Uh, it, it looks like a decapping pin which it really isn't. It's just the end of the gauge and it fits uh, onto this this cutter and the cutter right here uh, is very sharp. It'll stay sharp forever. Uh, and these caliber-specific gauges just simply wind on. Um, and there are different there are different ways you can do this. You know, I'm I'm, I'm not promoting Lee products, but uh, that's a that's a very uh, easy way to do it. And then I'll also show you in a little while the um, standard type of uh, case trimmer. I like this. I like this lubricant better than anything I've, I've ever used. Um, I've used all sorts. I've used everything from lanolin. Uh, I've used various different types of uh, oils and greases and things that are sold. I've used, I've used different waxes that are frankly nothing more than, I know they're nothing more than boot wax, uh, but I've used, I've used different products. This is completely water soluble, which is really cool. The reason I like this is because I just, I, with, a, with a tub of this sort, you just put a couple of dabs on the bottom of the tub, start with one dab, fill it up with unprimed cases, uh, toss it around, and that will simply, that will simply coat all your uh, cases uh, very quickly. And when you're all done and you've loaded up your cartridges, you just simply uh, immerse them in, uh, in warm dishwashing detergent and, and wash them off and rinse them. And you've got, you've got clean cases. You don't have to, you don't have to be... Uh, wiping them off, getting all the grease all over the place and everything. So it's, it's a really neat operation. Uh, this is, this is uh, 
I've never got a case stuck with this stuff. It works perfectly, and you won't get your cases dented either because uh, this dries. You can you can use it either wet or dry. You can uh, place it on the case and, and use it immediately, or you can simply tumble them and then uh, size them a week later. So whichever you, whichever you uh, is handy. It's really nice to have a universal decapping die. A universal decapping die is something that you will use uh, on and off frequently. Uh, it, this, this just allows you to decap cases, in other words, to take the, take the primer out uh, without having to size them so that you don't have to lubricate them, you don't have to run them through a die. To, uh, the, the, there's no contact with the case with this. All this does is simply uh, orient the uh, case inside and uh, drive out the primer. It's a very, very uh, nice tool to have. Um, and, it's, and, it, and it will work with any caliber, so I can use this with uh, the largest or the smallest of all the cartridges. That's a universal decapping die. This is a, uh, this is a uh, Wilson uh, chamfering tool and deburring tool. Now, I've had this, for, I've had this since the early 70s, uh, and, it's, and it's still sharp as a tack. Uh, they don't. They don't ever wear out. Just don't drop it on concrete. Uh, but these will never wear out. You can get a much less expensive one if you're just trying out the hobby. You can get a much less expensive one from Lee. That just it, it's just a little uh, twirl it type of thing uh, that that's, that's cheaper. And some people some people prefer to use it just because it's lighter. Um, your dies, <clears throat> rifle dies, uh, bottleneck dies. Any die that has a bottleneck has to be uh, resized with, um, with a, a two-die system. And they always have to be lubricated, and I'll, I'll, we'll show you all that process. Uh, but this is, the, this is the minimum number of dies that you have to have for the uh, purpose of uh, reloading cases. Uh, one, the, 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 first, the first die is the decapping and sizing die, resizing, and we'll explain that, and then the Second, the second die is uh, the bullet seating die. Sure, it doesn't want to come out. And the, the bullet seating die is adjustable uh, for the uh, depth of bullet. And you don't have to use any you don't have to use any uh, wrenches on this system. It's all finger adjustable, which I really think is nice. Uh, I've used I've used many different brands of dies through the years. Uh, this one here is nice because I can turn it. Uh, it's got a it's got rubber. Uh, it's got a rubber stop inside, a rubber O-ring that controls it so it doesn't float around. Uh, these dies also, uh, I see people complain about uh, that they don't have a lock screw on them. You don't need a lock screw on the way uh, on these the way uh, they're designed. They they turn freely, and uh, when they're when they're seated onto the when they're seated onto the press, they will never uh, lose adjustment. They immediately lock down tight, tighter than any other die I've ever used because the lock screws usually uh, usually pop loose and all of a sudden the ring is loose. These will lock down tight and once you've secured this uh, O-ring around uh, by at the top of your press, uh, it's tight forever. And you can easily remove it just by simply turning the lock ring and loosening the lock ring and that will remove the die and then spin it out, and you haven't lost your adjustment. Um, so that's that's a nice that's a nice system. Now, uh, the um, practical things that you have to have you need you'll find need for a funnel. Get a uh, wide mouth funnel so that you can pour uh, powder back into the jug. You'll need naturally you need powder of the uh, correct type for your cartridge. Uh, bullets of the correct type and also primers of the correct type. And primers, primers come in uh, four basic forms. There's small and large rifle and small and large pistol uh, primers. So uh, whatever, the, whatever the book calls for for your particular, uh, your particular cartridge is the one that you'll use. Never under any circumstances remove them from the sleeve uh, and put them into a uh, container. They stay in the sleeve until you're ready to use them. Uh, and even then, when they're in a when they're in a priming device, they remain 
they remain in a safe way. Uh, this, this prevents them from cross-firing and sending a chain detonation. Uh, they're, they're percussion sensitive. Uh, you don't want to ever have these explode in mass. These will blow your head off. Uh, if, if a whole, there have been people who have poured them all into a mason jar and blown up, um, blown themselves up in an entire room too. Uh, very, 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 very dangerous. Um, a powder funnel. This is this is an absolute must. You have to have a you have to have a powder, powder funnel uh, to control. Uh, the way you flow into the uh, cases. These are specially made. They're not, they're not a standard kitchen funnel. They have a, a orifice here that will accept cases from 45 caliber down to 22 caliber. And I like to have a, I like to have a flashlight. Flashlight is handy for looking down inside your cases, making sure that you're making sure your cases are, are, are all uh, filled. Uh, cause you, or also make sure that you don't have any under or overfilled. Uh, this, this allows you to just scan them before you uh, put your bullets in. That's, that I find is a must. Um, and a loading block. You can, you can make your own as I did here out of cherry wood or you, you, know, you, can, uh, you can simply buy them in, uh, made from molded plastic. Uh, make sure that they, make sure that they uh, are, are de designed with the holes for your uh, size cases. This one here, for instance, will only hold uh, cases of about 30 or 6 size, uh, it, or two, uh, 223 size will fit in there also. Uh, but, if, but if I have belted magnum cases, I have a, a larger uh, block for that, which I don't have anymore. I don't load any more belted magnum cases. Last but not least, you need to have a press. Th this, is, this is a nice press that I like to have. Um, I found it to be the handiest press I've ever used over the years. If you if you're getting turrets, get get these get these uh, lids right here. It'll come to you. You'd be a puzzle. It comes to you like this, and you will wonder what what in the world you're supposed to do with your turret. This is to store your dies individually on, which is a nice way of storing them. But if you flip it upside down, uh, flip the bottom upside down, then it becomes a storage case for your uh, turret. This simply, this simply drops into place. Once it's in place, it allows you to uh, either index it manually and use it as a single stage press, or you can put the rotation gizmo in it, and this will, this will turn it with this cam, this cam right here will uh, spin it uh, and index it automatically, so you can use it as a semi-progressive uh, press. Now, I've had some people ask me, and I've seen people concerned about the fact that it floats up and down, that this is somehow going to uh, lead to inaccuracy. It will not, because uh, th there, is a, there is a positive index point, and the, it, it floats only uh, upward to the point where it stops. Uh, all, your measurements are taken, uh, all your measurements are taken from an absolutely stopped position with the ram in the fully extended position, and that assures that you never have any issues with uh, imprecise um, die settings or anything like that. Trust me, it works. It's beautiful. Um, there, are, there are other dies on here that you can see that I didn't have on the other one. The other, the other one is uh, basically I've, I've set these aside because I, I really don't use the standard full length sizing die. I'm using just one rifle. And so therefore I use a uh, collet sizing die. This particular die uh, does not full length size and it doesn't require any bullet lubrication because it has four fingers that squeeze the, the, squeeze the top of the case neck and uh, size it around a mandrel. Uh, the, the cases are not shoved up inside and there's no distortion of the cases. It doesn't push them or pull them through a die process so they remain absolutely concentric. And it's got a uh, powder charging die that's really handy. Uh, that, that's something that you can use uh, to uh, pour your powder in. And you can, you can put your funnel right on top. So as it comes around, you can simply pour your powder in that way. This is the factory crimp die that has four fingers on a collet. And this squeezes the top of the case around uh, the bullet, much in the way 
much in the same way that this one squeezes the uh, case neck around a mandrel, this one squeezes the bullet uh, tightly and this, this actually places a crimp on the case mouth and if you don't even have a uh, cantaloid bullet with a crimping groove, this will, this will drive the case right into the side of the uh, bullet just as the factory does. Uh, very nice, it works beautifully. Um, and you know, a lot of this stuff, uh, a lot of this stuff I've uh, I've come to uh, enjoy just just because it does make life simpler. Um, and some of the things that you probably want to have at some point uh, is some uh, a supply of uh, labels. Uh, the labels come with the boxes of bullets, but usually they they kind of give you one one label per hundred bullets. Uh, I I just I just bought these recently. Uh, from uh, Midway, they're they're self they're self sticking. There's a peel back on it, and uh, you know it's it's small print, uh, it, yeah, but you know I'm not writing a book. It's just simply something that I can record the data on it, what powder I've charged, you know what the caliber is, uh, bullet weight, and all so forth. Because you're gonna you're gonna want to know that later on, um, and if you're doing any if you're doing any incremental tests, uh, it's nice to get a uh, larger MTM box that you can uh, organize your loads uh, down at the bottom with this style box here. This style box will hold uh, it'll hold a, a whole 50. But if you're doing if you're doing an organized uh, incremental test, you put this label on the top, and perhaps you only use every other every other row. I usually only use every other row and load four rounds of each. That's all you need to do. Um, and that way, there you can you can do an incremental test on all your different uh, loads that you're that you're working up. Those are the essentials. Now let's move over, and I'll show you some of the uh, things that you can get as you move along, and you know that you're going to be doing this. As far as the press goes, you really don't have to have you don't have to have an expensive press. Um, you can you can certainly get by with. Uh, there, there's a there's a hand there's a hand press if you if you like if you like just sitting in your uh, you know kitchen chair and doing it um, you can get a uh, you can get a simple uh, system that comes in a box I, I've had these uh, they're very precise uh, it's kind of fun to take them to the range and just if you if you're trying out different loads you can try them out right at the range and make them as you go uh, it's it's a it's a very slow process um, but it works it, it's very precise it seats the bullet. Uh, absolutely concentric, uh, probably more concentric than most presses and dies will do. You can you can have a blast looking through this book. It has everything that they make. Um, this is it also gives instructions on how to uh, reload. Now some of the things that I'm not too crazy about. I've had I've had uh, I've had varying success with their powder measure, so I don't necessarily recommend their all-in-one kit because the powder measure I found. Uh, tends to it, possibly they've improved it, but they tend to leak certain ball powders. Um, but as far as as far as uh, uh, extruded powders go, they work very well. Uh, their their um, scale is, I would say, it's it's something less than I would desire. Their scale is difficult. Uh, I think their scale is somewhat difficult to uh, read the vernier. It's it's got a vernier type of scale on it which is I think a little bit difficult to read um, I, that's where I would that's where I would uh, defer to a um, digital or standard uh, scale now here's a standard balance scale I've been using this I've been using this ever since I started reloading uh, so this this is a beautifully accurate uh, scale this scale here will uh, work down to a tenth of a grain, the same as any other scale, um, whether it's a digital scale or whatever. Uh, it's you know you, it is what it is. In other words, uh, once you've set it in place, uh, it, nothing's going to change. You don't have to worry about batteries. Uh, once that once that scale uh, balances and comes to a dead stop, it's just as accurate as a uh, scale that they use in a doctor's office. It's the same. It's the same exact principle as a, as a, a physician's scale. This is a powder trickler. Uh, powder trickler is a nice thing to have. It allows you to trickle uh, gr grains of powder in uh, just one or two at a time, or or maybe you can spin it faster and they'll they'll come out. 
Um, but that's a good way to that's a good way to bring charges up to weight. And uh, even if you have even if you have a digital scale, a powder trickler is a nice thing to have. What I did with this years ago it wasn't heavy enough, so I I filled it with I filled it with molten molten lead, and then I coated the bottom with. Um, silicone rubber so it doesn't slide around and that fixed that whole problem. Those I consider to be the essentials. Uh, anything that anything that you, uh, a scale is really something that every reloader should have. Um, you you can make extremely accurate loads, don't, don't discount the dipper. Uh, you can make extremely accurate loads with the dipper, I've done it many times. Um, these, these dippers are designed to be somewhat uh, underneath the um, maximum powder charge so you don't have to worry about an over uh, an overcharge as long as you follow the as long as you use the dipper which is uh, described for the loads that they give you uh, you can't go wrong um, they're generally very very accurate they'll be a little bit uh, below max but there's nothing wrong with that either uh, it'll give you a good accurate load now a powder measure is a nice thing to have when you when you get going you don't have to have a powder measure right away um, but it, it, it makes life it makes life easy. Um, it's it's a it's a handy thing to have. Um, I've used this one I've used this one for many many years. There are there are a lot of good powder measures on the market. I find this one to be one of the simplest to use. Uh, it it has it has a very firm uh, clack, and that's important. It has, it has two different size orifices that you can use for different size cases. You always use the largest one that you can use for a particular case. And that will assure that uh, you don't have bottlenecks. And that's why you use that flashlight. The flashlight will allow you to check your cases afterwards. How accurate are these? These can be extremely accurate with uh, ball powder, uh, to the, really to the tenth of a grain with ball powder. Um, but I'll tell you this, um, most, most, most extruded powders, even though, uh, even though they're granular in form uh, they, and, and they're coarser, they tend to be more forgiving in terms of accuracy. Uh, that's been my experience. So even though, for instance, 4064, IMR 4064 powder is known to have uh, rather uh, stringy uh, granules, but even though it had a uh, stringy granular nature that uh, would sometimes feel as if it was getting balled up in here, you could, you could feel a crunching cutting it off. Uh, and even though the charge weight would maybe vary uh, three-tenths of a grain up and down, uh, that's such, a, that's such a, a forgiving powder that it really didn't affect uh, the overall accuracy of the cartridge whatsoever. Most bench press shooters um, measure their charges, believe it or not. They don't, they, don't, they don't weigh their charges because a lot of times they're, they're loading uh, outdoors in the wind. They'll, they'll sometimes adjust their charges during the day when, things, when those conditions merit. And um, so they, they just simply, they, they charge their cases with a uh, powder charge. Lyman has one that has a side uh, bump around his little hammer that you can, it's a knocker. Um, I've never had any trouble with this and it works fine. I'll turn it so you can see. Uh, this is nothing more than a drum with a hole in it and this uh, as, as the powder feeds into the hole from the top it's adjusted at this bottom portion right here uh, and you don't use pliers or anything like this. It, it, it simply hold in place there's no fancy micrometer adjustment or anything, and I'll show you exactly how you don't need to have any of that stuff. Uh, it's very easy to set these up to within about a half a within a half a grain, and then you can adjust it very easily with a couple of turns of your finger. Now, if you're just getting into reloading, don't go rushing out and buying one of these. Uh, I I hand loaded for 12 years before I uh, got my first vibratory uh, tumbler, and this this is this is quite old. These are very very uh, durable and reliable. I don't know how many. Uh, perhaps thousands of hours that this has run. Uh, it's a very nice machine. Uh, I do use, uh, I prefer to use the um, walnut shells rather than uh, the corn husk. The, the walnut shells are coarser and they're, they, have a, they have a rouge, there's a red rouge that's applied to them uh, and they just work a lot faster than the uh, corn husks. 
this is all you really need if you if you're fussy and you want to have uh, clean brass. I cleaned these two old cartridges up right here that uh, have been sitting around uh, for for over 25 years bef since I last uh, cleaned them up. And uh, these these cases here I cleaned in le the both of them in less than a minute. So uh, that's all you need to have if you, if you really want to have clean brass. Uh, you know, go to the dollar store and buy a, a bottle of Brasso and, and uh, get a sponge and, and have at it. But if, you, if you're doing a lot of cases and you want to really have them pretty and everything and, and uh, so that you have, there's a pride factor involved with loading, I know that, uh, then these are nice to have. And they come in different sizes. This one here, I find that if I put about 150 uh, pistol cases in it or uh, like 223 cases even, it'll hold that. It'll hold It'll hold probably uh, 75 or so, 60 or 75 or so standard um, large cases like 308 or 3006. This is a non-essential item, but it's uh, it's a Forster trimmer when you want to start trimming a lot of cases. Uh, there are two different ways you can go. Uh, this the, the Forster trimmer uh, is very precise. It allows you to trim cases uh, with absolute precision and repeatability. Um, this one here is 40 years old, and you can see how nice it, it is. It just it, they, they stay brand new forever. Uh, the cutters just simply don't wear out. And there's a pilot that you can uh, get for uh, every for every size uh, caliber, for whether it's uh, 17 caliber, 22 up to 45 or whatever it is, you can get a pilot for it from uh, Forster. Um, I consider it to be a simpler machine than anybody else's out there for the same, uh, I think it's better value. Uh, it's, it's very rugged. You don't need to have a big massive, uh, you don't need to have a big massive cast iron base in order to get the job done. This, and the, the nicest thing with this is it's got a brown and sharp collet. A brown and sharp collet you'll find on a machinist lathe. <coughs> This is a brown and sharp collet. It, it, it has fingers that will uh, adapt to uh, most of the standard cases. So I can I can use a uh, I can use a uh, 223 size case in it. If I can get it over to the camera, uh, it'll take a it'll take a, a a 300 Winchester Magnum case. Uh, it'll take it'll take uh, you know a 375 H&H &H Magnum case. It'll take anything in between. And there, there are, for, for some peculiar calibers out there, there are other collets that you can get from them, but the standard one that's supplied is the one that works with virtually everything. Um, the, uh, the, other, the other thing that you can do with this particular machine is, what's nice about it is you can eventually get a neck turning. If you want to get into advanced reloading, you can... Uh, get a neck turning tool, which is a, a attachment. There's a carbide cutter right here that will cut the uh, excess brass off the outside of the uh, case neck uh, to make it concentric. And that comes also with an advancement cam that uh, allows the allows this to advance slowly into the uh, work, so that you basically you, just like a lathe, you turn it. You're doing an outside neck turning, just like they do. Uh, on your brake drums. It also has, uh, it, it also has, uh, for that purpose, it has uh, inside support pilots that are, uh, that are designed to go underneath the uh, outside neck turn. Now I'm sure you've seen the big machine that stands, uh, it stands like a tower on your bench. It's all made out of cast iron and it's got whirly gigs to turn around everything to uh, prepare your brass for loading. Um, yeah, it's, it's around, I, it, I guess it's about $400. Well, this is you know this is this is uh, Lee's version of the uh, Popeil Pocket Fisherman. Uh, it, it has a simple recoil starter type of clutch in it. Um, it it pulls you you pull it with one finger. Uh, it's got a uh, clutch wheel here, so you can turn it with your fingers. Uh, you just simply apply, you put the appropriate collar on uh, for different calibers. They're very inexpensive. Put your brass in. Tighten it down with your fingers, and you hold this. You hold this ring and just tighten it down with your fingers. And then, now the brass has to be the brass has to be deprimed first of all. It has to be decapped. But that's simple enough. You, you use that's what you use the uh, decapping universal decapping die. So you simply put your 
you put your uh, case length gauge into your cutter and it comes to a dead stop and just pull, just pull until the brass starts peeling off the end. There's three pulls. Leave it in place. Use your uh, deburring tool on both sides. And that's the end of it. That's it right there. So in, in just those short pulls I trimmed it and I deburred and chamfered it. That's all there is to it. Do another one quickly. And you don't need to do much. You only pull you only pull less than a less than eight or ten inches, and that does your deburring and um, and chamfering. You don't want to you don't want to make a knife edge out of these uh, at any time. But we'll get into all those details uh, at length as we uh, go into the uh, basics of loading. So this is this is just to show you the things that uh, you might consider getting. And again, don't don't be scribbling down too many things until you, I showed you the basics already. This is this is not essential. Uh, these run about uh, they list in the catalog, I guess, for about twenty-five dollars, twenty-four ninety-five. I think last time I saw, but uh, I think I paid uh, I paid seventeen uh, seventeen dollars and change for this one. There are there are a couple of um, particular houses out there that deal with. If you Google uh, Lee uh, loading equipment, uh, you'll you'll find this you'll find this in a couple of different places. Now don't be fooled by the simplicity of some of this stuff. This is this is a wiggly thing. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't have anything to do with the precision of that uh, ram pushing a case up inside. Uh, so, so with the these these um, shell holders are, are all. Uh, it's nice to have a couple. Uh, you can buy you can when you buy a set of dies, uh, Lee packs a shell holder in with it. That's as far as I know, it's the only company that does that. Most other companies uh, will scrounge another $12 out of you for a, a show holder or more. Uh, and these are better show holders. They have a tapered, they have a tapered lead section uh, right here, so that the so that the case doesn't get hung up as you're feeding it in. It's really neat. Uh, he's he's an engineer's engineer. So sometimes it, you know, a good engineer thinks outside the box instead of doing the same thing the same way. Uh, year after year. So this, all this, all this die is designed to do is simply uh, remove the primer. And where did the primer go? What a mystery. It actually, believe it or not, the primer ends up uh, being pushed into this uh, hole right here. It's the simplest system in the world. Um, it actually, when you, when you decap, the primer falls down a slot in the back of this, and it and it bounces into the back of this press here. And after about after about two or three years, if you're using it a lot, you take you just unscrew it and dump the primers out. So that's it. Um, and then once you've once you've done those, then you then you can uh, size them with the uh, zip trim, or you know you can alternatively just simply get the um, the other uh, system, the Forster system, or something to. Uh, do you uh, do your uh, uh, trimming? I find that they both have they both have uh, uses uh, at different times. Now, for those of you who are interested in uh, reloading military cases, um, this is your this is the necessary contrivance that you have to have. There are different ways that you can deal with uh, the primer pockets. Before I go uh, any further, let me explain military cases. <clears throat> Military cases, and even some cases which are sold uh, primarily for police use, they may even be 223 cases, uh, they, they have a crimped in primer. To be very honest with you, uh, I've, I've, done these, I've done these many, many, countless hundreds. Uh, it's a pain in the neck. I, I, really don't, I don't really find that it's, uh, it's that satisfying to do. There are, there are many reasons that I'll explain in a moment. Um, for one thing, these these things love to break um, decapping pins. Uh, decapping pins uh, pushed against a, a crimped in primer, uh, they very frequently just snap. The, the pins are hardened and uh, they, 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 they tend to be, uh, they'll last forever with a regular case. But when you're trying to defeat the, print, the crimped in primer, uh, then you can have problems. So those, those pins can be a little bit of a nuisance to replace. I keep them on hand. The other thing is that the 
very frequently after you've done this you find that the primer pockets w were worthless anyways because uh, these military cases as I explained to you before the pressures run very high uh, full military power is full military power uh, the crimped in the crimped in primer is basically to prevent blown primers and you know also to prevent primers from uh, you know coming out during cycling and uh, also allows them to be a little bit more uh, waterproof and everything but the the biggest reason of all is to contain the high pressures because uh, these these primers if they weren't if they weren't crimped in place they very well could be blowing but what I found is that very frequently after you get done decapping them that the the primer pocket itself uh, is, is already enlarged to the point where a, a primer won't stay put. Sometimes you can actually push it in with your finger so that, that makes the case worthless. So if I've, I've done as many as I've done as many as 500 cases at a time uh, only to find out that a hundred or more uh, were, were bad enough that they, they wouldn't they wouldn't uh, hold a primer and that can be a real nuisance. Uh, whatever you save in the process is, I, I think, is negligible. This this thing costs a hundred dollars. There are other ways to do it. Uh, you can you can chamfer the primer pocket, uh, but you know when it comes right down to it, this is really the only practical way to do it. You have to you have to swage the uh, pocket. And what this what this means is that the crimp creates a sharp edge, and you cannot attempt to reload a, a new primer, press a new primer in without removing that sharp edge. That sharp edge will absolutely catch a primer and prevent it from being uh, seated properly. And if you're using a progressive loader especially, uh, you'll have powder dumping all over the place because it'll tip that primer upside down and sideways and then the ball powder will be pouring out all over your press and making a mess. The way these work is pretty simple. Um, I'll show you a little gizmo that I've uh, used on my benches for years. This this is just a simple uh, Jorgensen uh, bench vise. You put a bench door, you see this right here, uh, my head's not in the way, and that snaps into it. And you can slide your board under it. And you can use this for any number of tools, so it's kind of it's kind of handy. So if you have a if you have a small bench, this is what I would recommend. If you have a small bench, install one of these and mount everything on board so you can mount your you can mount your powder measure on a board you can mount uh, you you can mount all kinds of things the only thing you can't mount on a board is your, your press but you can mount your your trimmer all those things so that you can stack these on a shelf and just use them as as you need them and secure them under the dog so this simply just slides on it comes in large uh, it comes in large primer size and small primer size uh, which is used for the 223. So that just simply snaps down and this enters the, there's a button that enters the um, primer pocket and swages it in place. That's the illustration, but I'd want to be able to turn it so that I can do it over the edge of the bench so that I can be sure I've exerted full leverage all the way down. There you go. And that's all there is to it. So it's just a one, one shot deal and you put a new one on and repeat the process. And that's all there is to it. Uh, but again, uh, consider carefully before you uh, launch into a project like this because um, it's it's a it's a real nuisance. Uh, I, the cases the cases are very frequently uh, not usable anymore because of the reason I stated, and um, the savings is negligible in the long run. You can brass is not that expensive. You can buy bulk brass uh, quite reasonably. Every now and then. Um, you know, different sources will, will have bulk brass like from General Dynamics or something like that that was originally intended to be um, made into military ammo, uh, but they don't have prime pockets crimped yet, uh, and there's no, they're not primed, they're still virgin brass, and they're, they're wonderful brass, uh, and they're very inexpensive, usually about 30% uh, 30 30 or more less than uh, buying bulk brass otherwise. So that's about it for now. Now the $64,000 question is, how much does this all save you? You actually will never save you anything. You'll load, you'll load more ammo, you'll spend more money than you ever would have uh, before you started reloading. So get that notion out of your mind. That's like, that's like a guy asked me one time many years ago, he said, how much money do you save when you go fishing? 
I said, I'm on what? He says, on fish. I said, you've got to be kidding me. You, know, you buy the rod, you buy a boat, you buy a motor, you put gas in it, you know, and you take a trip in a car and, and you buy all the lures that everybody uh, needs and everything like that. No, you, caught, you know, one, one trout costs you $3,000. So no, it's not, it, you don't save a thing. And that's $3,000 if, if you just go out with your waders on. So it's the same thing. You, you're not going to save it. You're not going to save a penny. What you will have is great value, however. You'll have, uh, you know, each, each individual round can be loaded uh, for an awful lot less. Um, so, you know, you, you, you can get a lot more, you can get a lot more bang for your buck, literally. Uh, and the, the original investment doesn't cost that much. Uh, but say, you know, by the time, everything that I have uh, combined here, not including like the, the load master progressive press and all that stuff. I'm sure probably by the time I'm done, uh, you know, runs around uh, $450 or so uh, or more. Uh, I imagine it may be closer to 550 or 600. I don't know, but that's that's to have that's to have pretty much a complete setup as I showed you here, um, and um, that that sort of thing amortizes itself pretty quickly if you do a lot of shooting. Uh, and then naturally, as you get more dies, uh, every time you buy a set of dies, you have to, you know, you have to buy the corresponding. If you're using a turret, it means you're buying a new turret. Um, if you're if you're um, loading another caliber, uh, when I say a caliber, different bore diameter, you're buying different size bullets. Um, it brings you into a whole other world. And you know, if if there's one thing that I'd like to see people uh, do. To start celebrating the fact that there are so many different cartridges out there. Um, I get so I get so bored with the with the 223 5.56 thing. It's extremely boring. I mean, yeah, they're fun to blast away and everything, but it, it's it, if there's anything that ever came around the corner that's so boring as that. Um, there's, there's so many more exciting cartridges that you can play with. You don't have to have towering cartridges to get, you know, like th shoot three miles away and everything. That's, that I think is, it, it kind of eats up the fun. Um, it, it just, there's so many nice cartridges that your standard bores, standard bores are easy on your, easy on your wallet, they're easy on your shoulder, they don't chew up powder by the, uh, by the pound. Uh, and they're and and they're very 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 accurate, very efficient. You know, you can shoot out to 300, 400 yards all day long uh, with with standard cartridges without any hassle whatsoever. So I'd like to see everybody start celebrating uh, some of the more standard cartridges out there, so that they don't become obsolete. They're only gonna they're only gonna keep on making these cartridges and chambering them uh, so long as people show an interest. But when when all the people out there, all they want to have is black rifles with adjustable stocks and, and all that stuff and ventilated hand guards and picatinny rails so that they can mount their, you know, their, all their equipment on it and they put all the stuff from their basement on it and everything. That's all they're going to make and I'd, I'd hate to see the tradition of shooting go that way. Uh, that it's, those have a very, very viable use. The fun, of, the fun of hand loading can be an awful lot of fun if you just simply uh, enjoy uh, enjoy it for what it is, not not grinding out ammo, uh, you know, senselessly just to keep on feeding into you know high capacity magazines, uh, but for a more you know for a more enjoyable endeavor, so that you can uh, take somebody out, teach them how to shoot, bring them down to the bring a youngster down to the uh, workbench, show them how to reload, pass it on. This is this is this is what this is what it's all about in America is teaching the next generation how to do it. Uh, and, and it's not just, it, but just teaching them how to stand there on the line and blast away by pulling the trigger back, they're not going to learn anything and, and frankly uh, it's one of those things you can quickly lose interest in. And I've seen in the last uh, two and a half years or so, I've seen the rack just fill up with uh, all these black rifles that have been coming back to the stores that people no longer uh, want. They just simply got sick and tired of them, uh, and and it was and it was something that they lost interest in. They they had they had a blast firing off the first uh, couple of thousand rounds. They bought a couple of thousand rounds and just shot it all off, and and they said, I don't, it's not very much fun. They, you know, you can do that only so much. So that's it. That's my spiel for today. God bless.